The Rottweiler today is one of the best-selling breeds. The breed's path is a very long one that started in medieval times in the German city of Rottweil, to be precise. It would appear that the morphological origins of the breed have ancient roots and derive from the crossbreeding of the Roman Molossians with shepherd dogs present in the area when the Romans, having crossed the Alps and gone through Switzerland, settled in the fertile green Germanic countryside, founding the city that later gave the breed its name. Naturally, as for all the oldest breeds, it is very difficult to be precise regarding its origins when they are lost in the dawning of civilizations. Very few signs and various hypotheses exist, and there are also several points of view concerning the Rottweiler. Some support the involvement of the ancient Tibetan Mastiff, a Molossian which in more recent times to those we discussed is thought to have arrived in Germany as a result of the Huns, a barbaric race of probable Asian origin. Others support the breed's direct derivation from a dog of cattlemen of nearby Switzerland. Also the Celts seem involved in the formation of the Rottweil breed, with the Molossians which followed them during their migrations. The latter hypothesis is supported by some remains found in Munich relating to a settlement of the Celts dating back to the 5th century BC. One is unable, therefore, to state with certainty which of these Molossians is the direct predecessor, but the most rational opinion is thus the one according to which more than one of them contributed to form the breed, the form that began to take shape and become recognizable at the time of the blossoming of the town of Rottweil. The clearest records in this respect are some inscriptions of the era in which the Rottweiler already had its own physiognomy and already had links with the German city. In these inscriptions, the ancestor of the modern Rotti people is depicted with a leather sack round his neck that contained the day's earnings of his herdsmen. Besides looking after the earnings and its master, the powerful Molossian also had to guide and protect the herds of livestock during their movements through the countryside and the overnight stays in open areas that were often treacherous and associated with bad company until their arrival in the areas of cattle farming and livestock markets. This was precisely the Rottweil area, which was a big and important livestock and butchery market at the time. The butchers of the era also used these powerful dogs to pull their carts of butchered meats and protect their goods and earnings. This is precisely why at that time the dog came to be known as the Metzgerhund, or butcher's dog. Its use as a guardian and herd dog lasted until the start of the century, when to promote railway transport, the shifting of herds by land was forbidden. Then the breed risked extinction. Its salvation derived from its sublime traits of fearless guardian and protector that attracted the attention of German soldiers, who included it in their war plans. The German and Austrian armies, and later on the police, used it actively, and in the first half of the 1900s, therefore, the breed was diffused in Europe, mainly as an assistant performing tasks of a military nature. If this contributed to the breed's salvation, it also contributed, however, to the alteration of its character traits, since, given the wartime needs in selecting the breed, enhancement of the aggressive attitudes of dominance, constitution and temperament was desired, while omitting and lessening the opposite and balancing attitudes of docility and tameness. Fortunately, there have been some enthusiasts who instead gave the Rottweil dog a civil position in their homes and who correspondingly selected them, trying to maintain its original characteristics that envisage a strong and brave but balanced dog and that, if managed wisely, knows how to be tame inside its own family group. The first club of the breed was founded in Germany in 1907. The purpose of the club was to push breeders to select seriously both in terms of morphology as well as the protection of the personality characteristics. It is precisely for the preservation of natural attitudes and character traits, in addition to physical health, that the by now popular dog shows have been supported by a work test for many years. The Rottweiler belongs to Group 2, thus defined, dogs of Pinscher and Schnauzer, Molossian and Swiss cattleman type. Instead, by definition of the standard, that which deserves particular attention belongs to the type work dog, watch dog and guard dog. Work dog means that the dog is genetically predisposed and built both physically as well as in character terms to have a strong work attitude. The need to have clear tasks within a pack, to have a close collaborative relationship with a leader. Its mind must be fully formed and stimulated by a close emotional relationship 
but also an executive attitude must be defined and worked with a strong and sporting obedience that will develop it and satisfy the natural predisposition of which the dog is genetically endowed. Watchdog and guard dog means that the dog has an acute sense of possession of its pack and of things it thinks are his, and a strong propensity in identifying territory as his. This results in it being jealous and very protective of its pack and its possessions, and showing hostile behaviour towards strangers who approach territory which the dog considers as its own, and will show its intent to control with all its strength, fearlessness and dominance. The Rottweiler is a medium-large to large-sized dog, strong, neither stocky nor lean, nor hound-like, nor high on its limbs. The exact proportions of its structure require it to be compact and powerful, evoking great strength, elasticity and stamina. The length of the torso measured from the point of the sternum to the ischiatic protuberance should not exceed the height at the withers by more than 15%. It descends from sociable and pacific stock and by nature loves children. It is affectionate, obedient, trainable and loves working. Its imposing appearance gives some indication of its origins. Its behavior is sure, strong-nerved and intrepid. It is always vigilant and attentive to its surroundings. Head. Cranium. Of average length, wide cranium between the ears. The frontal bone viewed from the side is only moderately convex. The occiput is well developed without protruding excessively. Stop. Pronounced nasofrontal stop. Physiognomy. Nose. The nasal channel is straight, wide at the base and with moderate tapering. The well-shaped nose is more wide than rounded, always black, with proportionately large nostrils. Muzzle. Should never be long or short compared to the cranium. Lips. Black, adherent, with closed commissura laborium oris. The gums should be dark. Jaw. Both the upper as well as the lower jaw should be strong and wide. Cheeks, pronounced zygomatic arches. Dentition, full 42 teeth, strong, with the upper incisors having a scissor-type closure over those of the lower jaw. Eyes, medium-large, slanting of dark brown colour, with very adherent eyelids. Ears, medium-large, hanging, triangular, attached high up and well distanced from each other. Well-inserted ears, which, when turned forwards, will confer greater width to the cranium. Neck, powerful, moderately long, very muscular, slightly arched, lean, without dewlap or slack skin under the throat. Torso, dorsal line, straight, strong, solid. Renal area, short, strong and deep. Crupper, wide of average length, slightly inclined, neither straight nor steep. Chest, spacious, wide and deep, approximately 50% of the height of the dog at the withers with well-developed chest and well-hooped ribs. Abdomen, unretracted sides. Tail, natural and extension of the upper line, hanging when at rest. Limbs, front. On the whole, the front limbs viewed from the front are straight and not narrowing. Viewed from the side, the limb is straight. The angulation of the shoulder should be around 45 degrees. Shoulder, sturdy. Humerus, very adherent to the torso. Foreleg, vigorously developed and muscular. Metocarpo, slightly elastic, strong and not rigid. Feet, round closed digits and well-arched hard plantar. Short, black and strong claws. Rear, on the whole, viewed from behind, the rear limbs are straight and not closed. In the resting position, the joint between the thigh and the leg forms an obtuse angle. Thigh, of average length, wide and very muscular. Leg, long, strong and with wide musculature, vigorous, with strong tendons, well angled, not rigid. Feet, slightly longer than at the front, equally compact, arched with strong digits, without dew claws. Movement, the Rottweiler is a trotter. The dorsal line remains solid and relatively still. The gait is harmonious, sure, powerful and smooth with a good stride. Skin. The skin on the head is taut, but slight lines can form when the dog is attentive. Coat. Quality. It is made up of hair and underfur. The hair is of average length, hard, adherent, compact. The underfur must not stick out from the hair. The hair is slightly longer on the rear limbs. 
color, black with intense brown-reddish dapple, well-defined on the cheeks, on the muzzle, under the neck, on the chest, and on the limbs, as also above the eyes and under the tail. Height and weight. Height of males from 61 to 68 centimeters. Weight around 50 kilograms. Height of females from 56 to 63 centimeters. Weight around 42 kilograms. The Rottweiler is a rustic, powerful, but agile dog. Even if its physical construction, aimed more at power, does not produce a high-speed dog, it has notable sprint capacity when motivated. The dog must be calm and serene, but immediately ready for work, play, or for any request from its leader of its fine physique. Its attitude towards work must be absolutely present and must be well developed and wisely channeled in a form of exercise that promotes physical and mental training, activation and the venting of instincts, and a continuous, steady, but respectful hierarchical definition. In the same way, it must also show tenacity and strength. Its balance and fidelity to its master must be immediately comprehensible. Boldness should not be confused with confidence, but instead one must always bear in mind that the confidence in itself comes from strong nerves and from an excellent balance, which ensure that even in front of strong stimuli, our Rottweiler maintains control of its own instincts. The Rottweiler is very dominant and territorial. These are the qualities that make it into a powerful and fearless watchdog, which is capable of accepting and facing up to any type of challenge. This is why it is essential that the docility present in the dog is developed to maximum levels with serious and hard socialization work with strangers and hierarchical definition in the family group. By following the same logic, not only will it be unnecessary, but it would be wrong and dangerous to indiscriminately push, without full knowledge of the facts, aggressiveness, distrust and dominance, which instead should be controlled and well managed from a young age. Knowledge and experience will make the difference between a solid, well-grown adult dog, confident and serene, a perfect subordinate, companion and fearless protector, and a dog inexpertly brought up as arrogant, over-dominant and possessive, that without correct education will be unmanageable, frustrated and potentially dangerous. Love for the breed consists in one's deepened acquaintance with its specificity and in the willingness to learn to enhance its quality balanced with and in respect of the splendid animal that our Rottweiler will turn out to be, ready to give its life for our safety. It is of fundamental importance that you visit a reliable breeder who will be able to help you choose the most suitable puppy for you and give the first useful rudiments for the dog's initial impact on its new pack. Afterwards, he will follow its physical development, be able to suggest a dependable trainer, having experience of the breed, and who will be able to help you follow the puppy's character development and its education. Having the possibility, and considering that you are choosing a friend for the next 15 years, you should visit a few breeders and take the time necessary in order to make a well thought out choice. A good family dog will be one which does not show excessive timidity and not even excessive boldness and vehemence, these being characteristics which in the first denotes excessive distrust or insecurity and the second excessive dominance and strength of character, the latter being traits found in a dog that will be more in keeping with an expert. A good breeder is one who will be able to give the idea of knowing the dogs of the litter morphologically but also character-wise. This will mean he has spent some time with them to observe them and play with them and for you will therefore be an indication of true passion and serious interest and socialization work with humans that will make all the difference to the outcome of character formation of the future adult dog. A good breeder will ask you what you will expect of the dog in terms of physical activity and work. He will ask where you live, how much time you will have for your dog and whether there are children or adolescents in the family. He will ask you if you've had a dog before, and if so, which breed, in order to assess your experience in handling a large-sized dog of strong character. These will be your guarantees of reliability, and at this stage, trust the breeder. Let him point out which is the right puppy for you. Within the same litter, there are always puppies that, although having the same type of predisposition, are different in levels of dominance, possessiveness, and therefore docility. A dog that is already two months old, that shows confidence in dominating the pack of siblings, will touch our hearts and make us proud. But this dog will prove unsuitable for a family with small children, which ideally requires a dog as the children's game companion. 
Instead, it would be a suitable dog for a person with long experience in handling what will turn out to be a powerful and very strong-willed dog that will surely look to become head of the new pack. A puppy that shows more relaxed boldness, even if vivacious and attentive, will be more ideal for a family, where, however, there is the desire on the part of adults to devote the necessary time to the growth, education, release, and later on to training the new canine friend. The best thing would be to make the puppy's arrival coincide with one of your holidays or when you have extra spare time. A dog is an animal of fixed habits, and every change to its environment and its daily routine is a cause of stress for it. The puppy, besides being small and inexperienced, will until now have psychologically relied on the security provided by its known environment and by the pack of siblings. The move to the new environment and the separation from its pack will be a reason for confusion and insecurity. If it arrives home with everything already in place, definite and organized, it will allow the puppy to settle into the new environment in the most gentle and most serene manner possible. You should also avoid taking it out immediately for walks that will cause it more stress than pleasure. By avoiding this, you will also avoid immediate contact with other people and unknown dogs, meetings which will be absolutely necessary after a few days, but decidedly premature at this delicate moment, and that would be the cause of additional confusion now that the dog must focus on you as its new pack. The most common error, apart from that of immediately running to the vet or taking it for walks around the block or the city, is to over-cuddle it and the tendency to overprotect it and make too much fuss upon the puppy's arrival home. Some tenderness is surely a good idea, but be careful not to exaggerate. In addition, one tends, when putting it on the ground, to leave too much space at its disposal. Letting it move all over the house or the garden is not okay. It will certainly tend to patrol the territory, as it is unknown, but territory that is too big will be a cause of stress. In reality, a space the size of a room is more than sufficient to initiate our puppy to a new life, to new rules and the need for new toilet training and social education. The main rule when talking about correct growth in a puppy is that which says, when your hands, eyes, attentions and intentions are not on your puppy, it should be confined to its kennel. Let us make sure we understand this concept well. In nature, puppies are not free to run around far and wide over the entire territory of the pack. Their lives and freedom are managed by the adults who decide when it is time to go out and when it is time for meals, rest and play. The meal times, for example, are when the adult dogs return from work, hunting. Playtime is when the adults have available leisure time or have time to play or to oversee the puppies' play. But when the adults leave for the hunt, the older dogs or some subordinates, authorized to oversee them, stay in the vicinity of the den and the puppies are confined to the same. It doesn't matter whether they like it or not. It is for their own good and they accept it as such. Naturally, it is accepted by the little ones that appreciate the sense of security that the den offers them. By keeping this natural image in mind, we're able to do much for our puppy's growth learning to assess its needs in a less human way, to bring it up to the best of its potential, and, it might seem strange, in the simplest way for us. Therefore, you should decide on an initial confined place like a room, the kitchen for example, or a garden enclosure, where you will put its den, the Vary Kennel. The Vary Kennel, or transporter, is the cage that is used for transporting dogs and also during air travel. Getting your puppy used to the Vary Kennel will be easy, useful and natural. It will be very difficult and at times impossible to do it without causing profound stress when the dog is adult. The Vary Kennel will allow you to manage your puppy's freedom and to begin the home and toilet training correctly. If it comes up against an obstacle while running about, for example a sweeping brush, and knocks it over thus frightening the puppy, do not run and pick the puppy up to protect it. Since, in reality, what you will achieve is to confirm the need to get frightened and escape. The correct attitude in these situations is to react calmly and serenely, with indifference. If possible, leave the object on the floor. You can pick it up at the first opportunity. But since it will happen often, by leaving it on the floor, the puppy will treat it as a game. So, get up, and as if nothing had happened, put the object back and attract the puppy's attention to one of the toys that you have prepared for it. Your indifference to the occurrence will mean that the dog, having assessed your reaction, thinks, ah, it's had no effect on the boss. Obviously, there's nothing to worry about. 
and it will not be frightened the next time round. Together with the cage, you will already have prepared, as we said, some toys to be left down for the dog in its territory. In addition, you will have bought two bowls, one for water and one for food, a soft and light collar of fixed type, not those that slip off, and a light lead made of fabric or leather, but not too wide that would make it heavy. Moreover, it would be a good idea to buy, in addition to the rubber toys left at its disposal, a soft sausage toy for puppies to attach to a length of cord and two small balls with string. These will not be left lying around, but their use will be managed by you and used when you play with your puppy directly, to then be put away by you. The Lead Like the cage, the lead is one of the basic tools of a dog's life. If well managed, the lead will not be a problem for you or your dog, but will instead be the link between both of you. It is for your safety, as well as that of your dog and of others, but also serves to maintain constant communication between you and your dog. The first effect of the collar and lead can be one of annoyance for the puppy. This is why it is better to associate it with something positive and distracting. For example, you can put it on your dog at mealtimes. The collar will then be left on. Let the lead drag along the ground for a while, maybe while you play with the puppy, without however letting it bite the lead. If necessary, distract it by throwing it a small ball. During the first short walks, do not be severe if the puppy tugs on the lead at times. As soon as it is accustomed to the lead, you will be able to correct it. Instead, in the opposite case of a puppy that refuses to budge and stays behind, you should adopt a cold and decisive tone. Continue walking slowly on ahead, without stopping and without looking behind, and above all, without turning back. And as soon as the puppy reaches your leg in leaps and bounds, stop and give it lots of praise. You should know that there is an unofficial but international rule that dogs are walked on your left. It is therefore best to accustom it straight away to the correct side, rewarding it and praising it each time it is solely on your left side. Naturally, for now, you will be the one to look for the correct position. The game that educates. Dogs love to fight, chase and bite. The soft sausage toy tied up to a long piece of twine will be useful in stimulating its predatory instinct and in letting your dog bite it and thus satisfy its natural instinct. Move the soft sausage toy in front of your dog as if it were a prey and make it miss repeatedly and then let it take it. Praise it, make it struggle for it by pulling the cord slightly and then let it win and take it for an instant. Catch your dog unawares and get it back and off again in pursuit of the prey. Ideally, two people are best for this game. One who holds the puppy on its lead, rewarding and stroking it, while the other manages the prey. Be careful during the teething stage. Tugging sharply may cause your dog pain. The two small balls with the twine are used to teach the dog to retrieve and return. For now, the puppy is very small, but you can start to familiarize it with this game. Socialization. After the first week of your puppy's arrival home, the moment to socialize it has arrived. The Rottweiler is a watchdog and guard dog, and this is why it tends to become over-distrustful and over-protective if it is not socialized abundantly. This is an absolute necessity for the owner of a Rottweiler, as is the absolute need to check its dominance, as we will see later on. For now, avoid laziness and get out and about in city centers and public parks. However, a word of caution, your dog should always be on its lead, and if you decide to let it run around with other dogs in some enclosed parks, do not allow other adult dogs to treat it roughly. Disregard what other owners might say. There are rumors and grossly wrong beliefs that can ruin a young puppy's delicate psychology. If you really want to find it a playmate, look for a dog of more or less the same age, of opposite sex, and ideally belonging to a similar group. If in doubt, do not let them play. A close-up sniff will be a sufficient sign of socialization, where there is no threat or clear dominance and where there is an attitude of invitation to play. A final piece of advice. Avoid talking to your dog at length. Avoid those importunate monologues in which you attempt to explain the how and why of things. The dog is not a child and will never go through the period of always asking why. Indeed, it has absolutely no interest in knowing why and is unable to understand a conversation. Use few sounds with your dog 
always the same ones, and instead learn to hold back words and modulations that are too diversified and too high in tone. Excessive use of words will have the opposite effect, that your voice and words lose importance and meaning. Basic education. For correct basic education, you need to think of the initial months up to the first year of your dog's life as the most important period. The knowledge and the techniques concerning education and training are nowadays very accurate and advanced, so it's a good idea to go and visit different instructors. Do not stop at the first one you find just because it is near where you live. Ask and gather information and select different ones that you will visit. Base your choice on what their abilities and experience appear to be. A good instructor is one who knows and uses all the techniques and who knows how to adapt to each dog, knows how to look at a dog as an individual but who has profound knowledge of the species and the difference between breeds. But let us see what are the necessary basics of a good education and let us return therefore to our puppy that now readily answers to its name, that has learned the bag game and how to play with small balls and that has been and still is well socialized with people and dogs. At this stage the puppy is now five to six months old. Conduct on the lead. This is a fundamental part of the life of the dog-master duo. What may appear so difficult to accomplish is instead straightforward. Only a little perseverance and patience is required. The secret is to think the opposite of how it would come naturally. The lead must be long, the longest available on the market. Every time the dog reaches the end of the lead and stretching it starts to pull on the lead, invert your walking direction brusquely and completely. Praise the dog as soon as its shoulder reaches the height of your leg. By doing this, the dog will correct itself and will not associate the correction with you. It will soon learn to pay attention to your direction. The sitting position. With the same morsel method that we use to teach it to come to us, we will also teach it to sit down. Toys can also be used if the dog is not a particularly greedy type. The important thing is to use a moment of high motivation, that is, when the dog is very focused and eager to get something. By moving the morsel or the small ball slowly above the dog's nose, but without letting it take it, it will make the dog naturally place its behind on the ground. Associate the sound sit with your gesture and its movement. A light push on the dog's behind will help the dog to sit if additional help is needed. Reward it with the morsel, combining the sound good with a very pleased tone, or throwing it a small ball. When the dog has shown it has understood this game, gradually decrease your gestures and the visual motivation. The ultimate aim is to give only a vocal command, obtain its posture and response, and then reward it by taking the treat from your pocket. The lying down position. From the sitting position, put your hand with the morsel or toy low down between the dog's front legs. By sliding your hand forwards along the ground and associating the sound lie down, you will soon teach the dog to make the correct sound position treat association. As for the sit command, associate good and the treat with the dog's correct position. Also here you can help the dog with a light push, this time on the dog's shoulders. These gentle methods are the only ones allowed as long as the puppy is very young, and in any case until the dog has shown it has understood the exercise. This will help you to set the education and the formation of a collaborative spirit. Upon growing, however, your Rottweiler will develop determination and strength of character, and according to the dog, its dominance will start to come through. Signs of boldness, rebellion and exaggerated possessiveness are not to be underestimated just because at seven to eight or nine months the puppy does not have the strength of character or such physicalness to frighten us. It will soon be strong, sure of itself and capable of not limiting itself to just threats. Not even an excessive physical reaction on our part, however, will be well received. It will do no good except to jeopardize its trust and make it unreliable. When our puppy enters the adolescence stage, it will test the people around it to establish its role inside the pack. It is a natural step. Its character starts to form and its attitude starts to change. The moment has arrived to also modify ours, and gentle and motivating education is backed by a more willful and determined attitude. 
The reliability of the perfect Rottweiler companion and subordinate lies in its self-confidence, trust and respect, and in its worship of its master. Therefore, the dog should not be subdued. It should be managed and corrected, respecting the strong boldness of this fantastic breed. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. This is a serious mistake since what may be digestible to us and a source of nourishing substances often cannot be digested by dogs or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. This is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from three to eight hours. Then the food passes into the intestine where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. The stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet, which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. Without going into detailed food studies that would require a specific treatise, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet, even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fibre, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation, given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines, where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. 
A buildup of vitamins can be harmful and therefore if you use pre-prepared feed you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements and if in doubt consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. Deficiency in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. There is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will however be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential. If pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. Eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water fresh and plentiful, that must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to 18 months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. The decision to have a dog is an important one to make, which must be thought over carefully without ignoring some useful basic information. The vaccination prophylaxis must always be carried out with utmost care to try and protect not only the puppies but also adult dogs from the most common illnesses. Generally speaking, a puppy leaves the breeder after having been vaccinated at around 40 to 45 days with a triad vaccine against canine distemper, infectious hepatitis and parvovirus. A second quadrivalent vaccination, also including leptospirosis as well as the three ailments already mentioned, is generally carried out after three weeks. An additional vaccination can be carried out after a month, again quadrivalent, to be then replaced annually throughout the dog's lifespan. A dog can be vaccinated only if it is in perfect health and thus also free from endoparasites. 
Appropriate anti-helminthic treatment must be carried out normally twice a year. Different types of ascarids exist, each of which specifically infests an animal species, man included, and there is practically no risk of zoonosis, that is, transmission of the infestation from dog to man. It is important that dogs are also kept free from ectoparasites, that is, those that live on dogs such as fleas and mites, both of which are hematophages. Moreover, fleas act as an intermediate host for a type of taenia. Numerous specific products exist to free dogs from these annoying parasites, but one must not forget to also carry out appropriate disinfesting operations in the areas where dogs live. The arrival of spring exacerbates the problems caused by undesired guests, the mites that arrive along with the initial spring warmth. A run in the meadows through woods, perhaps near groups of farmhouses and farms where there is livestock, can result in our canine friend returning home with mites, not necessarily since some factors may exist which make a dog more or less susceptible, also depending on its general state of health that can influence whether or not a dog will pick up these akari. They represent a grave danger to dogs because they transmit pyroplasmosis, a serious infection carried by protozoa of the pyroplasma species that affects pets and also causes death if not discovered and treated in time. The symptoms in its acute form are represented by fever, also sthenic, asthenia, pallor of the apparent mucous membranes, and hypochromia of the urine that can also become brown-black in colour. In advanced cases, jaundice and a comatose state which could possibly result in death. The mites suck blood for two or three weeks and once having mated, the female then detaches itself from the animal and deposits the eggs a week later. The deposited larvae, recognisable by their reddish colour, are minute, like tiny beads. They also look for a host on which to climb, sucking blood for several days. They then detach themselves and after a few days change into octopede nymphs of bluish colour. They become adults towards August or September. With the arrival of autumn, the adults immediately upon hatching then lay dormant in cracks in the ground until the next spring. In general, the mites attach themselves to less thick skin such as ears, armpits, groin, between the digits of the paws. Therefore, as a precautionary measure, we should always examine our canine friends for signs of any undesired guests after a walk in the open. Correct dog hygiene starts with coat care. For most breeds, but not all, it is advisable to brush the coat almost daily in order to remove the hairs that have reached the end of their life cycle. The coat of many breeds requires specialised grooming which is to be carried out several times a year. One must not generalise about the fact that a shiny coat is a sign of good health, since in some breeds it should have a tendency to be dull. Dogs must not be washed too often so as not to damage the protective function of the sebaceous glands. The skin in normal conditions should always look clean without dandruff deposits or desquamations of any kind. Should cutaneous alterations appear, such as eczema, alopecic areas, i.e. hair loss and failure of hair regrowth, thickening or the appearance of abnormal pigmentation, consult your vet without delay. Cutaneous alterations due to mycosis or mange are spread by contagion, but only in the case of particularly debilitated animals and when one fails to observe the most basic hygienic rules. Claws must also be checked periodically. These are normally worn down in dogs that undergo normal physical activities, but it may be necessary to shorten them with the aid of a special tool. Oral hygiene should never be overlooked, and especially in miniature breeds, tartar removal is necessary from time to time because it can cause pyorrhea and bad breath. Certain bones are available on the market that besides constituting a treat for our four-legged friend, act as a natural toothbrush. In puppies aged between four and six months, the deciduous dentition is gradually replaced by the permanent one. Regular inspections of the mouth are advisable during this period to check that everything is okay. 
The existence of cardiopulmonary filariasis, a serious disease caused by a nematode parasite, Dyrophilaria imitis, or the blood and heart, has been known for several centuries, as has been known the important transmission mechanism of the disease by the mosquito for about a century. However, it is only in the last 20 years, due to the rapid diffusion of filariasis in dogs kept for company and work dogs, that research institutes, pharmaceutical companies and vets have paid increasing attention to the problem. It is therefore important that dog owners are also aware, even if in general terms, of the existence and phenomena of the parasitosis. The transmission of the disease occurs through the mosquito's sting, which takes up the filaria larvae by sucking blood from an infected subject to then inoculate them into another healthy dog. The high contagiousness of the parasitosis is therefore easily understandable, in addition to its seasonality, spring-summer. During a period of around six months, the larvae in the dog's blood grow into adult worms that are situated in the heart and pulmonary arteries. In turn, the adult filariae produce small larvae called microfilariae, which will live in the blood. The dogs most affected are obviously those that spend more or less long periods outside, hence gun dogs, work dogs, and those that sleep in the open. The damage induced by the presence of the filariae is of considerable seriousness for that which concerns the cardiocirculatory function and initially shown as a tendency for dogs to tire easily and the presence of a cough or respiratory dysfunction. The vet giving treatment at this stage will perform different clinical and laboratory tests that will confirm the presence of the parasites. On the contrary, the damage caused by chronic cardiopulmonary filariasis is extremely serious. The alteration of the cardiocirculatory function is often accompanied by liver and kidney lesions and a state of generalized hypersensitivity in the whole organism. The prevention programs that have only been practicable for a few years thanks to the use of specific new drugs are simple to carry out and do not involve toxicity risks for dogs. After having carried out a test to ensure the absence of a previous infestation, the oral administration of a medicine once a month for the duration of the entire hot season will give dogs effective protection also if they are stung by an infected mosquito.